Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor to see almost close to 100 uh, participants from, from NUS MBA Finance Club. Uh, thank you all for taking time uh, to spend the evening with me. So this evening, uh, we're going to try to introduce you something a little bit more interesting. Um, it's a little cousin of venture capital called Venture Debt, which I'm sure most of you on this uh, session today uh, have not heard of it, about it before or have heard about it, but are not very clear about what exactly Venture Debt does. So stay for the hour and you will realize um, actually Venture Debt is a very interesting financing instrument for the venture capital in the industry um, and startups in the whole of Southeast Asia is really tapping on this uh, financing instrument to empower growth and to minimize dilution as they grow their business. But let's dive into a little bit of uh, 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 understanding of what this, this lot of you have, right? Uh, within and the understanding of what the lot of you have uh, with the terminology of equity and debt. Okay, I, I, I saw this, I heard this uh, uh, podcast um, from Howard Marks, right? Uh, about embracing the psychological uh, psychology of investing. And he was talking about some connotations uh, on the investing asset class uh, and, and whether is it positive or negative, uh, the, the, the users all attribute it to one of the class of either is it at equity or debt. Okay, so I guess, you know, 53 of you attach uh, positivity with equity, uh, three of you attach uh, negativity with debt, right? And I'm sure if I ask you the other way around, it will probably be the same uh, 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 weightage as well, right? And, and that's no difference there because for a very good reason, uh, one of the reasons being equity is always uh, being attached to the, the term returns, right? So when you invest in equity, you're always looking for returns and you're not looking at the risk, right? But on the other side, when you look at debt, right? Debt is always viewed upon as something that's actually quite risky, okay? And this is the psychology of, of investing. And when we came out uh, with the asset class of venture debt for Southeast Asia, uh, the initial uh, uh, sentiment that we got from investors, the investor class, right? is that venture debt is a very high risk instrument for them to invest in, right? They're not looking at the returns, but they were looking at the, the, the risk side of the equation as well. And, and we started off with a little bit of a hump, trying to overcome and help investors understand why venture debt can actually be a relatively low risk instrument to invest in. And at the same time, if you took, if you if you know how to do venture debt well, right, you can actually uh, uh, justify the returns back with the equated risk as well. So let's go back to the basics of venture capital, right? So venture capital is something that uh, actually funds and fuels innovation. It's very important. Um, the banks don't want to feel very early stage ideas for fear for for fear of failure, and that's where venture capital comes in to fill that gap, right? Uh, so here in this example, uh, uh, Sue actually has, a, has an, an, an idea, uh, but the bank doesn't want to provide her with a loan to allow her to actually start the business, right? But on comes a venture capitalist called Sam, and Sam uh, is willing to invest equity um, to split the company so that uh, he gets sufficient return when the company is successful and gets sold off for a nice profit as well. Venture capital has been uh, around for many, many decades already. Um, and venture capital actually provides the kind of risk capital that fuels innovation, right? Uh, this is a very uh, a famous logo that you know here. And, and the FANG group of companies, right? Facebook, uh, Apple, Amazon, uh, Netflix, and Google have in some way or another raised venture capital in, in some way or another along their uh, growth journey. And, and what I want to do is to help you understand a little bit about how a fund structure will be, right? A venture capital uh, firm has this classical uh, group of, of people involved in it. 
uh, so that they can actually make it work both from a capital standpoint, both from an investing standpoint, um, and together uh, identify the set of companies that they can actually provide risk capital to, um, and at the same time provide the return back to the investors of the fund. So what will be normally attached to uh, a venture capital fund, right, uh, are the two top uh, group of, of uh, partners. Uh, one is a general partner, and then the other one is a limited partner as well. So the limited partners are the investors of the fund. They provide the capital that allows the general partners, right, who are managing the fund to actually uh, run the fund, operate the fund, hire the talent to do it, um, uh, originate the deals, look for the deals, um, and invest into the deal, manage the deals, and then seek an exit for the deal. And at the end of the day, the, 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 fund, the funds that are generated and the profits that are generated will get returned back to the limited partners, right? So, so these, these are the few uh, key stakeholders in the venture capital fund that you should be very familiar with. So the general partners are known in short form as GPs, the limited partners are known in short form as LPs, um, and then and then that's how the fund structure uh, typically would be like. What what the uh, LPs are looking for, right? Are really uh, the high risk and the high return types of rewards. Um, they are looking for deals, right? They are looking for opportunities. They are looking for companies, right? That are disrupting um, traditional industries. Uh, so in the case of Paramount, they are trying to. Uh, uh, disrupt the, the pet care industry as well. And you find many other uh, types of companies in different types of traditional industry. For example, Grab, right? Grab, Gojek, uh, they, are, they are disrupting the traditional uh, ride hailing uh, uh, business as well. And when you go in as an investor early on into the cycle, and if you are able to survive that valley of death, right, then the returns could be in the thousands of time, right? Um, this is how a, a fund actually makes money. That's how a GP like myself, uh, we are looking to, to, to operate a fund. Um, and at the same time, uh, when we identify very attractive companies that can return uh, good profits to the fund, uh, makes money for ourselves and the limited partners as well. So hypothetically, I have actually uh, uh, put down some assumptions here. It's a $100 million venture capital fund. Uh, a typical fund life would be about 10 years uh, and the fund would actually charge a 1% management fee that's actually paid uh, by the limited partners. So if you look at the, the bars below, uh, 100 million uh, minus 10 million management fee, that leaves the fund with about 90 million for investing into startup companies. And uh, imagine you split this 90 million into five investments right, 20, 20, 20, 20, and 10. And, and you go on and, uh, you know, put the money to the company, the company put it, puts it to good use. And at the end of the day, you generate 120 million in returns, okay? So how does this 120 million in returns get distributed to the stakeholders of the fund, which is the GPs and the LPs? The first 90 million goes back to the LPs, right? So the LPs get back all the money that they have put, in, put into the fund. Uh, the LPs also get back the management fee as well. So one of the very interesting point uh, that a lot of the LPs subsequently uh, realize is that I'm paying you management fee, uh, but the GPs are not enriching themselves from just making management fee, right? Because if the management fee is rich enough, uh, actually, I don't have to do any investing um, and I just have to draw a very nice salary for myself in order for me to be uh, 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 sufficiently well off, right? So for me to earn a single dollar of profit from uh, the venture capital fund, I need to return every single dollar that the LPs have given me. So it's 100 million here. And with the remaining 20 million of, of profit, it gets uh, a separated into 80% uh, to goes to the LP and the 20% goes to GP as well. So in the VC industry, uh, there's this jargon two and 20. So 2% is typically the management fee that a VC fund charges. And then 20 is the carry profit that the GP are entitled to when they make an investment that generates a profit, right? So this is re really the motivation behind how the general partners of a venture capital fund makes money and help 
the limited investors of the fund to generate profit for their money that is invested. And if we dive into the capital structure of a non-VC company, right? A non-venture capital uh, company could be a SME, a traditional SME, uh, or even a corporate, right? Whether you're a mid-cap or a large-cap uh, corporate as well. And if you look at uh, both the square there, um, a typical uh, SME or a, a mid-cap or large-cap company uh, will probably have uh, anything between, you know, a, 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 a highly leveraged uh, company, debt ratio company, right? Uh, it could be on the left-hand side where, you know, equity could be as much as, as debt that's been injected in the company, but it could also be a structure whereby the, the, the stakeholders of the company have decided to really go in and uh, uh, use that, right, to finance the ongoing uh, expenses of the company as well. But when we switch it to a venture capital uh, back company, right, a VC back company, and this is typical of a company that we um, actually go and look, up, look for, right? It's a company that has been predominantly financed by equity, right? So you can see 100% of, of equity back against some of the assets of the company there. And when we come in, right, as a venture lender, uh, we, we, we usually stand for a small proportion of the total capitalization of the entire company itself, right? So compared to your the earlier example, uh, the companies in a venture capital backed company has very low debt uh, leverage uh, in the company, right? And, and I'll show you why. And, and this is the reason why you know, banks typically will reject uh, a bank loan application for a company like that. Number one, because there's a very, very little track record of the company financially. A company, a bank would actually ask a, a venture back company for at least three years of bank, sta uh, bank statements. And they will ask for maybe, you know, three audited years of financials as well. And most of these companies that we go after as venture lenders do not have this kind of track record yet. Okay. The second reasons why bank will reject it is because you have to look forward into the future about where the company will be in the next five years. Right? And banks are not very comfortable when it comes to forward projections. They like to look at what has happened before in the past and they, they look very little into the future as well. Okay, so um, you know, when it comes to venture debt, uh, it really is the baby cousin of venture capital. Uh, venture capital is the one that actually goes in there to finance a lot of the risk capital of uh, the initial capital of a startup company. And then as the company progresses in their growth journey, that's where the venture lender would actually come step in, right? To help take some of those capital structure off into the debt form. In the US, uh, it has been a very predominant form of financing instrument. Um, and on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see some of the lenders that have been operating in the US uh, with the most, uh, uh, probably the most well-known and reputable one being Silicon Valley Bank itself. So in the US, there is a venture lender who is a, a, a bank, right? So they operate like a bank and, and that's where uh, DBS Bank wanted to emulate uh, the same kind of structure uh, as in Silicon Valley Bank as well. But the, the, the bulk of the other lenders there are actually private lenders. And if you look at the, the bar charts on the right-hand side, uh, roughly within a 10 year uh, space, right? the amount of venture debt that has actually gone into US-based startups, right, has grown tremendously, right? It has grown from 5 billion in 2010 to almost 25 billion in 2020. Okay, so that's quite a tremendous leap in terms of venture debt financing going into the ecosystem as well. So I think we're not gonna go through some of these things, but if you realize that in April last year, right, there's a very big tech giant uh, called Airbnb, right? And they raised $2 billion in debt, right? In April of 2020, they paid 12% interest and they gave some warrants to the initial 1 billion of debt and the second billion dollar of debt only got the interest component as well. Why? Right? So the question is why are they not raising equity dollars for doing that? And there's a few reasons for them not doing that. Number one, 
um, is because of the COVID situation, the revenues of Airbnb actually dropped drastically. I think that's about 90 to 95% drop in top line revenues. Equity investors is more than willing to give Airbnb uh, the extra capital for them to be able to survive and tight to COVID. But there's a condition, right? The equity investors wanted to invest at a much lower valuation than the, the, than the last round valuation that Airbnb has raised money on. It was almost as though there's about 50% cut from the last round of valuation. And by doing that, right, they would effectively be diluting a lot of the late stage investors who have come into Airbnb, right? Number two, they can actually get this debt going very quickly as compared to an equity uh, round where you have a lot of negotiation um, on the legal terms and so on and so forth. The debt instruments can actually be put together, I think roughly between you know, four to six weeks time frame, um, Airbnb was able to, to get the cash into, their, into their, their banks very quickly as well. Right? So debt is actually a very quick way of actually raising capital um, into the company. So between equity and debt, um, this is a very good use case of how a, even a tech giant like Airbnb has managed to leverage on debt financing to help them to kickstart their operating uh, needs for capital. Um, Grab raised about 700 million. Uh, that was in 2017. Um, really to grow the right healing services in Southeast Asia. Why? Uh, because they were, they were raising this particular capital, right, for an, a specific need uh, within the, the operating uh, capital structure. Uh, Grab, uh, if you remember back in 2015, 16, when, when they were at, at their very early days, uh, Grab didn't uh, have a, a very reliable uh, and they were using a lot of uh, old and very used cars, right? Uh, that didn't provide very quality services for their consumers. So they set out to do something that's a little bit uh, similar uh, to what Uber has done, right? Which is really go out there to purchase vehicles. And these are brand new vehicles that they can actually rent out uh, to the drivers who are actually use, doing the uh, Grab services as well. Uh, and to do that, to raise equity uh, would actually mean that Grab had, had to dilute themselves uh, with $700 million worth of equity, right? And the bankers and the lenders who came into this structure, right, love this structure because there's asset behind it, right? The, the cars that were purchased by Grab uh, can actually be used as a securitized uh, collaterals against the $700 million worth of loans, right? So um, having talked a little bit about the uh, basics about venture debt and, and, and what venture debt uh, has, has been uh, for the last uh, four or five decades in the US, uh, I'll bring you all the way back to Southeast Asia again. Um, we saw the opportunity uh, for uh, Southeast Asia's first private venture debt fund. Uh, there was a bank doing this, a DBS Bank. Um, Tamase had a joint venture together with UOB Bank. Um, and they had like a $500 million vehicle as well. Uh, but for other investors, family offices, other banks, right? If they wanted to do venture debt themselves or invest in a fund that, that allows them to, to tap into this asset class, they were not able to do so, right? So we thought, hey, why don't we actually set up a vehicle to do that? And that was how Genesis Alternative Ventures was born. Um, in, in April, which is uh, four months ago, we announced a $80 million close. Um, we are funded by quite a number of, of financial institutions. So there's CMB Niaga, which is an Indonesian bank, um, Alzora, which is a Japanese bank, and Korean Development Bank as well. Um, and at the back of us, there are fund of funds, uh, and there are also other family offices uh, who love this uh, a, a particular financing instrument as it brings to them a very balanced approach, right, towards both risk and reward. Um, we are also a profit with a purpose uh, venture lender. And what by that, we mean that we are actually selectively investing into companies that actually bring impact to their communities and societies, right? So, um, uh, you know, the, my, my team has been actually working very hard at, at, at unearthing some of these uh, portfolio companies that have potential impact. And, and we are proud to say that 40% of our portfolio actually have measurable impact that relates to, you know, poverty, gender equality, um, and so on and so forth. Um, how has the fundraising journey been uh, for me uh, as an entrepreneur and as a founder? It's a very tough job, right? Or I can say that it's not easy. 
So we started this uh, about three years ago, but we formally did our first close in July of 2019. We announced a close of almost $20 million with our first institutional investor, which is CMB Niaga. And with that, actually we launched the region's first um, Indonesian rupiah uh, venture debt uh, scheme, right? So for Indonesian companies, together with CIMB Bank, we were able to provide them with a venture debt that actually is in the local currency itself. And, and I think a lot of the Indonesian companies actually uh, like that idea too. We did a second close right in the middle of COVID, right? So in, in, uh, in April or May of 2020, uh, we actually uh, did a close with a fund of fund called Capria, and they are the ones that are actually powering a lot of the impact uh, investment pieces of our fund. Um, and then along the way, we have been investing and, and increasing the number of portfolio companies that we have in our staple. Um, and with that, in April of 2021, uh, we finally closed with $80 million. So this is not just a two and a half year journey. This is also a lot of traveling. Um, so we traveled to Japan, we traveled to Indonesia, we traveled to Malaysia, um, to Israel, to Europe, to the US as well, uh, meeting with all sorts of different investors from family offices to individuals, um, to venture capital funds, to fund of funds, and even uh, uh, some of the financial institutions who might be investors in the fund as well. So all I could say that it's a very fulfilling and enriching uh, journey for me. Uh, would I do it again? In fact, in, in about six months time, we will have to restart that whole journey when we are looking at uh, um, starting our, our second fund uh, for Genesis. So today, um, you know, we invest alongside the uh, top tier venture capital uh, funds. So we are, we are not competing with venture capital funds, right? We are actually investing alongside them. The VCs would come in with the risk capital to start the company off. And as the company grows into Series B, Series C, right, as they raise growth capital uh, to, to continue growing, that's where we have the opportunity to come in to participate as part of that whole uh, syndicate as well. Uh, we have about 16 uh, portfolio companies today. Uh, they are serving about 12 companies uh, all out of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, we are looking for companies who wants to raise debt. Um, and the target company would be typically a Series B plus company. Um, and, you know, uh, in the case of uh, Paramount, right, they, they were in the Series A uh, category, but we really like their, their, the, the, the business model, the market opportunity they were looking for. Uh, we know that, you know, with, with COVID, actually the pet category is something that was really exciting and growing and there's still tremendous headroom for the company uh, to, to really tap into. Um, the company is only today operating in, in Singapore, Malaysia, and, and slowly in Japan, but there's also a lot of regional growth in Japan, uh, in Thai, Thai, Thailand, etc. We can write anything between a two to ten million dollar check size, so we are not a small investor. We are fairly sizable, um, and we we like to see ourselves more as a sector focused investor rather than a industry uh, focused uh, type of investor, right? So we go for companies that are serving uh, B2B, right? So they are targeting business as their, their, their end customers. Uh, but on the other extreme, we also favor uh, companies that are serving the consumers as well, uh, but with a relatively healthy margins that allows them to operate uh, profitably. And in the middle category, very selectively a B2B to C type of companies, right? And these are companies that wants to raise venture debt for growth and working capital, even for acquisition. Right. So some companies see the opportunities, like, for example, in COVID, where there's distress or stress companies, right? And they see the opportunity to bolt on a existing business that will allow them to scale their operations much faster. Um, and many of them also look for venture debt as an insurance buffer as well. So this is the opportunity that we saw in, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and together with Price for the House Coopers, uh, we came out with a paper. And, and if you look at the uh, rate bars that are uh, protruding out towards the left of the chart, right? These are VC dollars that are actually raised uh, from 2014 all the way to 2021 first quarter, right? And at the peak of it, um, in 2018, there was about $12.6 billion that was actually invested into startup companies in Southeast Asia. Um, and just this, uh, the, just the first quarter of 2021, we saw about six billion of, of equity already invested, 
right? And the way to look at how venture debt could be a portion of the entire venture ecosystem would be roughly between a 10 to 20% uh, uh, a portion, right, of the entire venture capital fund, funding ecosystem can actually be done in venture debt as well, right? So if you look at uh, 2020, there's 8.2 billion, a uh, 10% uh, equivalent of that would be, meaning that there's about $800 million opportunity of venture debt that can be financed to startup company in the whole Southeast Asia region, right? Um, so in 2021 alone, the first quarter, there's 600 million alone. And if we, if we project the numbers, the equity dollars of 2021 forward, right? We could be seeing a record year of anything between 15 to $20 billion of equity money going in, which means that the addressable market for Southeast Asia alone could any, be anything between 1.5 billion uh, to about $2 billion of venture debt, right? So I see some questions coming in, but I will hold, hold on to those uh, and, and wait for those towards the end of the uh, session. So let's go into a little bit of the uh, nitty gritty about how venture debt works what venture debt is all about um, and, and, and some of the specifics, right? Venture debt itself is not a convertible debt. So we always get asked this question, so can you do a convertible debt? No, we can't because uh, venture debt itself is a straight debt. Uh, think about it as a, almost like a bank mortgage where you you know buy a house and you, 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 you look for a mortgage from the bank, right? The bank gives you the loan and in, in return, uh, you pay an amortizing, you amortize the loan by monthly repayment. Whereas a convertible debt is more of a quasi-equity uh, instrument, right? It allows the investors to be able to actually uh, convert their debt, right? Or stay as equity holders as well, right? So we don't do convertible debt. It's not a collateralized bank debt per se, because a lot of the, the companies that we back, right, are actually quite asset-like. So there isn't really things like, warehouses or, or, or physical assets, right, that we can actually collateralize. There's no personal guarantee or director guarantee against uh, any individuals of the company itself. It's usually secured against the company, right? Um, venture debt is not for pre-revenue companies, so we don't do early seed stage companies as well. Um, and we don't really compete with the traditional banks for the SME customers that they are so used to financing. How does venture debt work? Um, it's designed for venture-backed companies. So number one, there has to be a institutional venture capital fund on the cap table. Um, number two, it is suitable for tech or tech-enabled business model, right? So if there's completely no tech in the business model, there's something that we don't do as well. Uh, it's actually raised as a leverage against the venture equity raise, right? So typically when we uh, uh, you know, do a venture debt, uh, we actually go in when the company is actually raising uh, a round of equity. Um, the loan itself is amortized, meaning it's paid back on a monthly installment basis. And the debt is actually accompanied by equity warrant for the lender. So not only are we get, hopping on the uh, interest rate of the, of the loan, uh, but we also get some op an option to buy shares in the company if the company becomes massively successful. Let me show you how uh, venture debt uh, can be done graphically. Um, so for example, this company is raising Series B $10 million. Uh, traditionally, they will raise all 10 million in equity. Um, and, and hypothetically, let's say the, the company uh, gives up 25% of stakes, right? So with venture debt, what the company could do is that instead of raising the full 10 in equity, they can now raise a portion of that in venture debt. And the portion, that $3 million of debt, right, uh, is when, it, when you translate it into the option of the equity kicker, it's about 1% or so in the cap table. So what the company does is it end up saving about 4% of equity for itself, right? So this works very well for the founders. This works very well for the existing shareholders of the company. Another way of looking at it is that there are companies that really wants to fast forward and, and, and accelerate their pace of, of growth, right? Um, and instead of raising just 10 million, they raise 10 million of equity plus another additional 3 million of, of debt. Okay, what that affects is that it, they are giving an extra 1% of Warren for additional 3%, $3 million worth of capital, right? What the company can do with this is it can, it can actually, um, uh, you know, it can expand into another country. Uh, it can hire more talent as well. 
Um, and he can go and do a lot of things like acquire a small little company that he just does to put onto his own business. Um, this is how venture debt works. So uh, after raising series A, um, the company goes and raises venture debt that allows it to uh, uh, stretch its cash runway. Uh, and by doing that, uh, what it basically does is allows it allows the company to go out there to achieve a lot more milestones. And with the, the milestones achieved, it then allows it to uh, uh, be able to uh, ask for a higher valuation, okay? Um, and, and, and typically uh, venture debt reduces the equity so that it can actually do the same amount of activities that it wanted to, but at the same time also delay its next fund round of fundraising that allows it to achieve uh, more milestones that it has along the way. Um, venture debt use of proceeds is typically for a few things like uh, term debt, for example, that means you just add on to the operating expenses of the company. Uh, it can be used to fund inventory purchases, working capital, uh, for example, accounts receivable, or just a very plain old uh, insurance buffer. If you know growth doesn't happen as planned, uh, then it has a few more extra dollars in its bank. So having talked about venture debt uh, and how venture debt works and, and where we feature in the whole venture uh, equities uh, system, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, uh, the internship program itself. Uh, so we have a, a very active internship program that we started in April of 2020. Um, and what we're trying to do is to groom the next, uh, uh, you know, uh, era of, of investment analysts, right, uh, that actually will be suited for the venture debt uh, industry. Um, the venture debt industry uh, is a little bit similar to the venture capital side as well. Uh, you do deal origination, you evaluate deals, you negotiate uh, for a term sheet. And then after investing, right, you do a lot of the monitoring as well until the company gets to an uh, exit time point. Okay, but what the uh, analysts will get to, to, to learn is also that credit um, analysis uh, and, and the risk reward type of, of, of uh, understanding whereby, you know, you need to see it very differently. We want to reduce the risk as much as possible. We want to increase the, 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 the rewards, but balancing it all the way so that it doesn't make that uh, so much risky for the fund too. So for the career path of a venture debt analyst, um, I guess you, you, you can also still you know, move uh, laterally across to a VC fund. Um, you can work for a corporate venture capital fund as well, uh, investment banking, corporate banking, and so on and so forth. 